If you're ready to take your destiny into your own hands, you've come to the right place. This is The Bulletproof Entrepreneur, featuring interviews with the most exciting and amazing entrepreneur. Here's your host, Chi Odogu. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to the show today. If you love what you hear on today's episode of the podcast, go to iTunes and leave a review and a comment. It helps other great listeners like yourself find the show. And of course, you can always find more episodes of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast at www.odogwu.com. And without further ado, on with the show. Hey guys, welcome to the show. I have a great guest today. I'm talking to Joe Carlin. Joe is the co-founder of Value Guards LLC. It's a boutique business valuation, pattern valuation, and market assessment company. He's consulted for hundreds of entrepreneurs and companies over the past 15 years, including Westinghouse and Unicom Technology. Joe is also the author of a new book titled A Brief History of Entrepreneurship, The Pioneers, Profiteers, and Racketeers Who Shaped Our World which was published by Columbia University Press late in 2016. So I'm pleased to have Joe to come today to tell us a little bit about uh, this new book that he's written and also his life and his experiences as an entrepreneur himself, a business owner, and a valuation expert. So without further ado, Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Chi. So Joe, let's get right on into it. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure. So my background is in business and technology, and uh, I worked for as a business analyst for uh, a few different startup uh, companies and some more established software companies uh, after graduating from uh, an MBA and a master's of information systems. And then in, in recent years, I've been doing more valuation. Uh, I got certified uh, a number of years ago with the NACVA to, to be a certified valuation analyst. So I've been doing uh, business valuations and patent valuations, uh, mostly in the tech space, but not, not exclusively. Oh, okay. And what prompted you? I know you've written another book before this book. So what are some of the lessons you learned working with startups and companies in the tech industry, especially as a valuation expert? And what were some of the things that inspired you to, you know, look out and write a book on entrepreneurship? Yeah, well, it really struck me working, you know, primarily working with with entrepreneurs that much of what entrepreneurs do by bringing a new product or a new service to market much of 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 the impact of that entrepreneurial activity it, the impact extends beyond uh just dollars and cents and there there's often huge impacts beyond that social impacts and uh, and other really things that touch all, all, almost all aspects of life. And so I thought it would be interesting to look at history through the lens of entrepreneurship and to see how entrepreneurship is really one of the prime movers, not the only prime mover, of course, but mm -hmm. one of the prime movers of history. And, and yeah, that, that was that inclination started from from observing the entrepreneurs that that i was working with mm. what do you think is the definition of an entrepreneur well i like peter drucker's definition the best uh and he said that an entrepreneur is one who takes let me, let me get the the exact uh quote here but he said it's one who takes uh, existing okay well 
there are two there are two definitions I like. One is the individual willing entrepreneur is the individual willing to embark on an adventure in pursuit of of economic goals. But I think a, a more precise definition is uh, is Drucker's and I'm having trouble finding it here. But it's something to the effect is as somebody who takes who who finds new economic value in resources. So in other words, someone who takes something that is does not have uh, economic value or does not have significant economic value mm-hmm. and then does something to enhance the the value. Mm-hmm. So basically someone that, someone that makes something out of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Or or right. That's another way that's a way of restating that. Yeah. So I think that's that's a really well that's sort of a more specific definition. Uh, and I think that's, Oh, here it is. Sorry. Peter Drucker entrepreneurship as the act that endows resources with a new capacity to create wealth. I really think that's the best definition I've ever, I've ever read. Mm. And I, I tend to agree with that. I've never heard that one before, but uh, I think it has a, a powerful ring to it. So in your study of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, what are some of the common things or the the commonalities or the common threads you've noticed that entrepreneurs across time possess? Well, I think certainly the common traits of all entrepreneurs, regardless of how successful or unsuccessful uh, they are or were, is they all have some sort of vision. Now, in terms of what you know, they all have some some kind of vision that they're inspired by, and uh, they have a certain be- at least some degree of belief that they can translate that, realize that vision, and and make money from it. Now, <clears throat> delving more co- uh, <clears throat> into the successful versus the unsuccessful, that is uh, that's a, you know there's some different traits involved with that. Would you like me to get into that a bit? Yes, please. Sure. So for, and it's really interesting how, you know, the the technologies change and the names change, but the the basic human principles really stay the same. Mm. And uh, so for example, there's, there's a, there are examples of people going back to the industrial revolution, early industrial revolution, People who had excellent, an excellent concept, an excellent technological concept, and one example in particular that I'm thinking of that they they didn't bother to uh, patent it. And then there were people around the same time who had something that it's debatable if they even invented it, but they patented it hmm. <laughs> and they marketed it very aggressively and. Uh, in, and then in, in one case, you had somebody who boasted that he could pay the off the national debt of Britain at the time. And so it's it's very interesting because these that's that's an interesting principle because today you mean and I've certainly encountered this in people who've come to me to ask them to write them business plans or 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 do other work like that. Sometimes you have people who have an excellent concept, uh, a, a really excellent vision. And but the the execution part is is not there, or it's just okay. They've sort of fallen in love with their product, and they've they just assume the market will materialize by itself. So that's that's uh, I think people that that focus on execution and on protecting their intellectual property and those those types of fundamentals have have always done better. Uh, also, there are. I think a very interesting principle is this: the tension between the entrepreneur and the manager, and that also goes back yep. thousands of years. Uh, I'm thinking of one example in particular about 600 years ago. Uh, who um, uh, Hernan Cortez? But without without getting too deeply into that, the the principle is people who are great at they have that spark, right, and they're able to actually even get get beyond the concept stage to to actually establishing something. But then when it comes time to manage and consolidate it, that same kind of wild and daring personality that led them to to 
create that spark then becomes a liability because mm. they're too wild. They're all over the map. And at that point, their personality becomes a liability. And, and that's a very interesting tension uh, sometimes too. And I think that um, somebody I think who's managed that very well in modern times is Pierre Omidyar, who the, who started eBay. Mm-hmm. He knew that he had that he was gifted in a in a creative sense, but he he did not he did not trust himself to be a great manager. Mm-hmm. He just didn't think that that was his skill set. So he brought in Jeffrey Skull and then later Meg Whitman and. And so he 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 kept on as the creative mind, but not as the the, the manager, and it worked out very well um, for eBay. So I think that's a very interesting tension, and and, and that goes back to the, this, like your your earlier question about the definition of entrepreneurship, because sometimes people think of entrepreneurs and managers as sort of the same thing, but it's it's really not. Yeah. And there are relatively few people. There are some people, you know, like Bill Gates or or a number of others, there are some people who have, have are extremely gifted at both, but I think most most of us are not. Yeah, and I think as you were mentioning that, I think that brings up the reason why many VCs or maybe private equity investors always look for a team to invest in because they know that one person or two people may be the ideas and the initiators and the executors, but when it comes to like growing the business internally the other people may not necessarily have this the main initiators may not be the right people because they like the skill set and um i think there was somewhere else i I, was it billy graham or one of these other big preachers i believe also was talking about when i read in his biography that you know what the reason he can be out there you know preaching and doing what he does is because he has somebody that is running the business on the inside that is the manager that he as a big personality doesn't have the skill set to run the organization that he always has an inside man that every successful team every successful organization always has the person that is the face of the business or the popular entrepreneur as we all know them and then there's always the inside person that keeps things going kind of like warren buffett and uh, charlie munger yeah i i think that you know in 90 plus percent of, of the time, I think that's, that's really what works. And, and unfortunately what happens though, is we, we hear so much about these kind of superstar, uh, entrepreneur managers, like, uh, let's take someone like, like, like Jeff Bezos or, and we hear so much about them that I think many people, when they're starting a new business, they often see themselves, okay, well I can, I'll build the business and I'll be the same thing. I'll be the creative guy or woman and also the uh, the manager. And again, more often than not, that's not, not a good idea. So across in your study and in your research, um, has entrepreneurship always been positive to the economy or to the world? Are there negative sides to it also? Well, I think that, you know, I, I, I don't take a the, – the argument in the book and, and all the, the examples, uh, aside from learning a lot about what works and what doesn't work and learning about the evolution of entrepreneurship, it makes the argument about the impact of entrepreneurship, mm. not so much whether it's good or bad. However, I, I can still answer your question in the sense that there are – you know, one of the entrepreneurs highlighted in this book is Al Capone, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there, some of the other entrepreneurs highlighted in this book were were slave traders, mm. and so clearly, right there, you have it's clear that some entrepreneurs, some of them very talented in a business sense, were engaged in in things that were were uh, not not nice, right? Yeah. So the I, I mean, I think overall, my opinion is overall entrepreneurship, especially today, is I think a net positive for society. But certainly, historically, some entrepreneurial activities were 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 definitely had a strong element of exploitation to them, mm. and and there's no there's no denying that. 
So I think that, um, you know, there's, I think that when, when someone thinks of a business and they think of it in really in terms of not just how can I make money, but how, how can I make money and help, uh, society or address a certain problem, then of course, if they think in those terms, they're much less likely to start something that will, will harm anyone. And I think, I think today there's more really more of that kind of attitude, uh, generally speaking, than certainly in many previous eras in, in history. So I think that's positive. Uh, so that kind of almost means like the, it's kind of like people, like we're all born with different skill sets. So entrepreneurship is one of the innate skill sets, but it also needs to be managed and guided by your conscience or your morality, as it were. And depending on which side of the coin your mon- your morality falls, that's um, what's going to channel it into doing either positive actions or negative actions. Would you say? Yeah, I, I think that's true. And I also think that, that in the long term, I think generally that the company – Enterprises that that are built to last uh, are built as as win 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 enterprises, right? Win mm-hmm. a win for the company and a win for the customer and society at large. Because sooner or later, as the story of Al Capone illustrates, sooner or later you engage in certain kinds of things. They might make you money in the short term, but in the long run, it tends to to catch up and eventually not last. So. So yeah, I think thinking it's sort of enlightened self-interest, right? Thinking in mm-hmm. terms of how can I benefit, how can other people benefit, and in the long term, you're more likely to be successful like that anyway. Mm. And there's another big thing with entrepreneurship: are entrepreneurs born or are they made? Well, I think that I think there are elements of both. I think that uh, I think you have to have a certain not everyone is born with a with a a high tolerance for risk, and you have to have a relatively high tolerance for risk and uncertainty mm-hmm. to be an entrepreneur. And I think I think that might be a personality issue that people could be born with to some extent. That said, there are also an unusually high number of, of large number of successful entrepreneurs who had some kind of adversity in their lives and certain other common environmental influences uh so i think to some extent entrepreneurs are shaped but i think to a large extent they are uh i think it's both i think they're born and they're they're also bred in the sense that um you know i think a great example is is warren buffett when he was very young his father got wiped out temporarily Mm -hmm. And they didn't have deposit insurance back then, and so everything was gone for a while. The bank closed everything, and that made a huge impression on him. And he resolved right then and there that he was going to become very, very wealthy. And so, uh, you know, by, by the time he was he was eight, he had read the whole library full of investment books at his you know local library. So, I think that you could make the argument that if that adversity didn't happen to to him, he might not have been as successful as as he is today and there are many other examples like that so i think that um and that's just one thing adversity mm-hmm. there's other elements too so I, yeah I, I think it's it's a mix of of both innate personality and the things that happen to us that early in, especially in early life yeah because i've i've observed i mean from people i know and from books i've read that most most of the time the things that galvanize or catalyze someone to be an entrepreneur is they kind of have something that they're trying to overcome some difficult challenge some chip on their shoulder or some insecurity that's really really at the core of their being that they are fighting to overcome and um, vanquish right yeah yeah exactly okay. i think that i think that and there are quite a few stories in in a brief history of entrepreneurship that uh, illustrate that in different ways so looking at your research and the book as you've written today um what's the role of formal education in most entrepreneurs because 
we know that in the media it's very sensationalized to see oh bill gates dropped out of harvard uh what mark zuckerberg dropped out of harvard to start his company and they make billions and peter thiel is now pushing the proposition that he'll uh, he'd rather pay high school students not to go to um college but to use the money and start their startup so does formal education play any role in terms of um indicating or spurring entrepreneurship further well i think that there's a lot of nuance to that issue i mean for example we uh bef- before before we start we 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 talked a little bit about uh uh fuku opeki in uh in nigeria and she was in you know she's involved in something very technical mm-hmm. right and I wonder if she hadn't gotten her uh, degree in in engineering, actually I think multiple degrees in engineering, would she have been able to be so successful in in, in telecommunications? Yeah. Uh, and so I I think that as especially as as many new businesses relate to technology, I uh, you know I I would think that that really understanding technology, whether it's biology or whatever is related to the business, I would think that that, that would be important. Um, something like Facebook, you know, maybe not as, as relevant, but I, I think it really depends on the, the situation. Now that said, I certainly, you know, having a lot of education is no guarantee of, of entrepreneurial success. Mm-hmm. But again, if if somebody's if you're starting something that's that's technical, in some way, I think having that uh, a strong educational background in that technical area uh, is probably pretty important in most cases. Uh, and when it comes to, I think my favorite topic, or and I say that sarcastically, uh, when it comes to failure. You know, it, that's another thing that has been over glamorized or made exceptionally um, attractive. Oh, you have to fail, you have to fail. There's so much uh, love for failure in the media <laughs> right now. <laughs> you know, yes, that does play a role in terms of developing someone's resilience and, uh, and um, what I call it, resilience and relentlessness. But in your research and in your analysis, for example, is failure something to be that much celebrated? Because there, are, I I do know one or two entrepreneurs that have almost kind of never failed at anything in their life. So, is it really good to put such a big emphasis on failure? I think probably not. I think that it there's a bit of a balance there. On the one hand, certainly, if somebody fails, uh once or even a few times at something they shouldn't be told okay you're hopeless forget about it uh but at the same time i agree with you that it, you know it, beyond a certain point it doesn't really make sense to celebrate failure too much because the objective of entrepreneurship is not to fail mm-hmm. right but you do have to you do have to have a certain tolerance for failure you have to be able to deal with that uh, embarrassment and and whatever to some extent, and there are certainly many examples of, you know, obviously Thomas Edison is a classic example of somebody who kept trying and kept failing and until he succeeded. Uh, so, so I think that uh, I think there's a certain you need to have kind of a balanced view on that. On the one hand, not not to uh, crucify people for for failing, but on the other hand, not necessarily to celebrate it uh Mm -hmm. to the extent that it is now i I agree with you that it's kind of gotten a little bit out of out of hand yeah and i like that you mentioned thomas edison because just yesterday i was actually in a conversation with someone else and they were trying to tell me that that thomas edison's main skill wasn't necessarily being an inventor it was being more of a a promoter and a marketer and being able to raise money from people that he he didn't necessarily do the work so um 
there's that oh, there's that big debate all the time that you know certain entrepreneurs are they're known for something while their superpower is actually something else. Do you think that that's uh, a cult the the image the public image that they cultivate? Do you think that that is something strategic that is actually uh, created or manufactured by the entrepreneur, or is that just distortion of the issue over the ages? Uh, I think prob probably the latter. I think that uh, although you know there probably are some cases where where the 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 entrepreneur kind of cultivates his his or her image, but I think what you're, you're bringing up it also touches on what we were talking about earlier in terms of. Uh, you know, people sometimes see a business that has something to do with technology or whatnot, and they think, okay, the founder must be a technical genius. Mm -hmm. But, but the, very often the the patents that that brilliant that that well known business is uh, is, is based on, uh, very often there are other inventions in that field that are more innovative. Yeah. Uh, that are just led by someone who just doesn't ho know how to promote anything, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you have someone who's with with an inferior technology, but who can promote the 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 heck out of it, and yeah. who who becomes a superstar. And the, and there are many examples of of that, and that's something people often don't realize. Mm. And across, uh, at least now, from what I've been reading in the media and what I've been seeing in the business landscape, companies are actively recruiting entrepreneurs they're hiring consultants to train their employees on having the entrepreneurial mindset and different positions and titles like you know entrepreneur intrapreneur has risen over time in different companies across the world so uh, what's driving the change in large companies being forced to to think and to move and to act like uh, entrepreneurial companies I think there's so much uh, technological disruption happening now, and it's happening so quickly that even the largest and most established companies uh, in technology or in, in other industries, because every, everything's affected by technology, mm -hmm. they're getting they're getting nervous, and it's they're feeling vulnerable that there's these, these little nimble companies out there with with some creative people who who can put out a technology that totally disrupts their industry and and could in some cases wipe them out. So they're thinking, okay, we need to adopt that mindset ourselves so we can see these threats before they happen and maybe turn these threats into our, our own opportunities. Mm. And I think I think that I think that it's this huge wave of disruptive technologies that is are really shaking things up out there and as we start to wrap up and wind down the show i just have one or two questions for you so um sure. when should a person give up on their entrepreneurial ambition Oof. <laughs> yeah that is a i mean that's a that is a tricky question yeah but i do i do think and and of course there's personal factors and different things but mm -hmm. but I do think that I don't believe that one should persist 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 no matter what mm. right yeah I mean I think you need to see what's going on in the market I mean if you started a typewriter company in the early 80s or something where people were well, 70s or people were still using them and then you're, you're persisting with the typewriter company even though you know everyone's buying computers that's not there's nothing noble in that. It's just dumb. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of an extreme example. But I think entrepreneurs always have to continuously look at what they're doing and say, you know, is this still relevant? Is this going to work? And not necessarily give up, but at least think of how to adjust what they're doing to for, for keep adjusting for a greater likelihood of, of success. And what are some of the key... Um character personal characteristics or the key success factors of entrepreneurs that you've found in your research well i think that it's a mix of you have to have 
that spark. You have to have the confidence, to, like you were saying before, to the, you know people who just can go out and raise money and who are not afraid of rejection and uh, not afraid to ask for what they need. Uh, but at the same time, people who know their you know their strengths and in some cases their limitations and mm-hmm. who can bring in the right partners. Uh, you know, people who are certain, they're cautious to some extent, like they don't bring something to the market before patenting it or things like that. So there, there are a mix of, of characteristics. And in some cases there, it, there it's very nuanced because it's not just, for example, huge confidence, mm-hmm. right? Because yeah. you need a certain amount of confidence for that spark. But at the same time, somebody who doesn't know their limitations could really that can be a problem. So you need to have confidence, but you also have to be a certain amount of humility in some cases too. Oh. And uh, I guess this will be for you personally. So what's a significant failure you've experienced in your life and how have you overcome it? Well, there have been... Uh, you know, there have been some uh, you know there's been a, a there's a business i I invested in uh, that uh, I thought would do well still might do well but uh, it's a startup and you know all the fundamentals were there in my opinion and still are but there's been a number of uh, issues that have come up, and it might not, it might not get off the ground. Oh. So, but I knew it was a risk when I when I put some money into it, and you know, I I think that one has to be, if you have the like you're talking about the entrepreneurial mindset, you have to have a tolerance for you do have to have a tolerance for for risk and for some degree of failure. Oh. Uh, so if you know, it's not. It's um, but you also need to to calculate your risks and not put too much, not risk too much. In this case, I didn't risk too much. So I think uh, you need to have a, a risk of adventure, that adventurous spirit, tempered with some some long term cautious thinking. Okay. So it's always a balance. Okay. So be willing to at least. Um be daring and adventurous, but at the same time, use your head. Don't uh, don't do it in a careless or you know ignorant way. You have to think exactly. and weigh the risks and plan. Exactly. And, yeah. And and I guess uh, my final question for the day is: um, What are some of the books, uh, messages, software? You know, websites uh, and other tools that are inspirational to you and have helped you grow as a business owner, as an author, and as a researcher. I like uh, I like Ink Ink Magazine. I like Fast Company. I like uh, I I would say probably my favorite entrepreneurial biography is i think you'd like this title a passion to win <laughs> uh, why, why, why do i think i've heard that one before oh uh, some yeah, oh yeah exactly yeah <laughs> and and it's it's a great it's really a great biography yes and it's uh it's it's just an excellent illustration of someone who just with with a lot of drive and intelligence what what he was able to to accomplish so i think it's very inspirational to, to entrepreneurs and i think my own book is ins- inspirational as well in a different way but yeah. yeah so as as we talk about your book so where can people learn more about you find the book and of course uh, interact with you, you go to value-guards.com and there's information there about the book as well as what i do or, or if they want to go straight ahead and obtain the book they can go to amazon.com and look me up joe and last name is c-a-r-l-e-n great 
And with that said, we've reached the end of the show. I really want to thank you for coming on the show to share your words of wisdom about your entrepreneurial journey and, of course, about the book, A History of Entrepreneurship. Thank you very much, T. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Joe. I really appreciate it. Great, and that's done. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the show today. If you love what you hear on today's episode of the podcast, go to iTunes and leave a review and a comment. It helps other great listeners like yourself find the show. And, of course, you can always find more episodes of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast at www.odogwu.com.